So many factions, so little time. Whatever am I to do when it's time to choose? There's always all Reliable. He's never let me down. Franz can never let you down. If the campaign goes bad, it's you letting him down. But you know, sometimes I don't want to live with all that pressure on me. The entire old world resting on my shoulders, that's a lot to take in. And I have to start the game bordering the Bretonians. how gross is that? No, sometimes I want things to be a bit more relaxed. A little bit easier on in the early game, since Festus isn't breaking down my door to defecate all over the Elector Counts. Just Nakari and some Druki, hardly anything worth worrying about. And to continue not only the elf simping, but my addiction to the Total War series, how about we sit down and discuss the finer points of playing the High Elves? Because to completely ignore everything I just said, I want the world to rest on my shoulders. Only this time, it rests on my shoulders and I have pointier ears while it does so. I have no idea what I'm on about, this intro has been all over the place, and I'm not changing any of it. Let's learn how to play the pointy ears. I fight for the greater good. The High Elves of Ulthuan, or the Asur, are High Elves, and really that's all there is to it. Pointy ears, they're incredibly good at magic, and indeed good at pretty much everything they set their minds to, because when you can practice something for 300 years straight, you damn well better be an expert. And as is the case with all elves, they're arrogant beyond measure and are on their way to exiting the mortal plane for good. Only instead of it being like Tolkien, where their time has come and they're just leaving, they're instead just having to constantly deal with the world's problems. When the world's problems look like this, it's no wonder they're dying out. But by the grace of Asurian, they are not going gentle into that good night. Their history stretches back to the beginning of the Warhammer world. When the Old Ones first showed up, they started making races to find the best way to combat chaos. The Elves were first. They were gifted the paradisical island of Ulthuan to live on, which, interesting fun fact, is more of a land boat because it doesn't stretch to the bottom of the sea. Rather, it floats on the ocean by the power of magic. Unfortunately for the Old Ones, while the Elves had a mastery of magic matched only by themselves and their Slan servants, the Elves were too fragile and vulnerable to corruption for their liking. But the Old Ones weren't one for genocide, ignoring all those races the Lizardmen wiped out, whose lore starts and ends with the Lizardmen wiped them out. So they let the Elves chill on Ulthuan, and that was that. For a while, the Elves just lived in paradise. They had armies, sure, but never used them. What was the need, after all? Chaos wasn't here yet. Until suddenly it was, and then they swiftly learned that their armies were actually kinda dog shit. The Old Ones pissed off and left the planet, and it was up to the Elves and Lizardmen to fight Chaos, then being the only ones capable of doing so at the time. The early Tomb Kings and their gods cleaned up Nehekara, but that was about it. Dwarves probably could help too, but in proper Dwarf fashion, they just closed the doors to the mountains and waited it out. In the center of Ulthuan, the elves created the Vortex to drain away magic from the world so demons would stop showing up every couple of seconds. They also had one particularly interesting individual named Anarian amongst themselves. He made his mark on history by killing demons. While plenty of people in the Warhammer world have done such a thing, he was really extra super good at it. It helps that he grabbed the Sword of Cain, because Cain in Warhammer Fantasy has a habit of leaving his shit all over the place and hoping someone picks it up so they can kill elves with it. Between the Vortex and Anarian, the world was saved in a resounding elven victory. And all it cost was millions of millions of lives and the North and South Poles being permanently rendered corrupt by chaos. A resounding elven victory. Now in order to get to the part where I talk about gameplay in this video about a video game, let's speedrun the rest of High Elf history. Anarian had some kids with the Everqueen, thought all of them died, but they didn't actually. Since he thought they died though, Anarian slept with an elven woman named Dami Mami Marathi. Promise that's definitely her real name, and then he died. I guess he just kinda disappeared, but functionally he's dead. They had a kid named Malekith, who was a cool guy and was friends with the Dwarf High King at the time. I already made a video on him, so go watch that for his full story. But he decided that he wanted to be the Phoenix King of the High Elves, so he made the current one drink poison. Then he lit himself on fire and declared civil war on the rest of the elves. He lost, tried to explode the entire world, succeeded but then failed, and then ran away with a mountain boat. His porn star mother also went with him. The High Elves explored the world and were still friends with the dwarfs, and indeed they colonized a good chunk of it. Like colonial Britain, just with pointier hats. Then Malekith did a little prank we like to call a false flag attack and caused a war between the High Elves and the dwarfs. It also helps that the Phoenix King in charge at the time was the biggest idiot in any of the Warhammer settings to date. Anarian's original kids came back, and they formed the family lineage that would ultimately result in Tyrion and Teclas. Dwarves and High Elves kick the shit out of each other, and it's just generally not a great time to be a Dwarf or a High Elf. From this point on, the Dwarves and High Elves were in a state of near-constant decline. High Elf history in particular goes in the following pattern for the most part after this. The High Elves have a brief moment of peace to start thinking about recovering from the last major catastrophe. Some massive, world-ending threat occurs that the Asur must sail out to deal with. The High Elves deal with it. Malekith invades Ulthuan and kills a bunch of High Elves before he's repulsed, and then rinse and repeat for about 6,000 years. 
Until modern times, that is. With the world in even greater danger than ever before, the Asur have set about to try and actually permanently fix the problems they face. Teclas went to set up the Colleges of Magic in the Empire because he's a cool dude like that. Finnabar, the current Phoenix King of the Elves, has begun friendly relations with the dwarves once again and was even allowed into Karazai Karak, which is insane. He has the honor of being the first elf to have Bugman's Ale, which I would kill to try. Tyrion is doing his best Daenerian impression and stabbing every conceivable enemy to death, which is good because there are a lot of them. And Alariel is combining My Little Pony with Doom by murdering the ever-loving shit out of chaos with the power of love and this big stick she found. But can they do it? Well, that's up to you now, isn't it? Now for the lore pros of Play in the High Elves. If you like elves, these are the elfiest elves. They're super duper elves, much like every trope in Warhammer is taken to the extreme. Their mages can unmake armies, their swordmasters take the weight of their eyelashes into account when practicing sword swings, and they're arrogant in a way that only comes about by earning every single drop of said arrogance. If that sentence bothers you, consider that it's my channel and I get to simp for the elves on my channel. Seriously though, do you want to play as elves that actually earn their arrogance? Because like elves or not, you gotta admit these guys put the work into earning their pride. Well yes, the lizards helped, it was the elves who ultimately created and maintained the only thing draining magic from the world and keeping demons from manifesting wherever they want. They survive for thousands of years not only defending against, but outright destroying countless threats to both themselves and the world as a whole. Dragons have chosen them specifically as their best friends for life, aside from Miss Cold and Aloof over in Not China. If nothing else, that last one has to explain it. If a dragon decided that you were its best friend, you'd have an ego the size of Texas. Do you like fantasy names to an almost unhealthy degree? Because if so, well, first of all, I get it. Naming things in silly make-believe languages is great. But second of all, you'll love the High Elves more than anyone. They live on the island of Ulthuan, led by Finnabar the Seafarer and Alariel the Everqueen, and all sorts of other fun fantasy names exist to the point that it's almost fun to play a high elf campaign just for that reason. I love the Empire of Man, but sometimes I want my fantasy setting to have fantasy elements in it, not just be aggressively German at me. And lastly, if you want to be the good guys, the High Elves are a pretty solid contender for that. Warhammer Fantasy is in general a lot more morally black and white than 40k, which is fitting to me with it being a fantasy setting and all. It's still Warhammer, so yeah, the High Elves do some pretty fucked up stuff from time to time, but at the very least it comes across as either one crazy guy going way too far, or something they really don't want to do but see no other option. Which is different to 40k because a lot of people there are just hateful assholes. The High Elves, meanwhile, do their best to fight battles that affect every race, not just their own. They've helped to train humanity and trade with nations all over the world. They saved Bretonia before, although admittedly they were mostly just there to protect a waystone. Of course, with that being said, those waystones exist to keep all of reality from crumbling into the realm of chaos, so once again, their efforts are frequently the only thing keeping the world from ending. If you like playing as the good guys, can't do much better than the High Elves. I mean, their primary colors are red, white, and blue. Of course they're the good guys. No country with red, white, and blue on their flag has ever done anything wrong. Well, I let everyone think on that wonder of a sentence, let's talk about the pros of the High Elves in gameplay terms. For starting positions, you've got the whole spectrum of difficulty when starting out, depending on how sweaty you're feeling. Alariel is my personal favorite, and probably the easiest. Yeah, she's got to deal with both Nakari and Dark Elves, who are potentially wielding the Sword of Cain, but they can only come from one direction, and it's still pretty simple to handle them. Just win an ambush battle in front of the gate, and you'll probably be fine going forward, at least in the early game. Tyrion's also easy enough, but he's got to deal with Noctilus, and he seems to have gotten a lot more aggressive since Warhammer 2. Eltharion can be hard to handle with his split-focus start, but it's pretty fun, and he's got more opportunity than anyone else here. Alethanar starts about 5 feet from Malekith's doorstep, so have fun with that. Imric has about 30 turns before Grimgor Ironhide is knocking on his doorstep. And Teclas? <laughs> <laughs> Good fucking luck, Teclas. This also means you have a wide variety of enemies to fight with the High Elves. Sure, whichever campaign you pick will have roughly the same enemies each time for that campaign, but if you're sick of fighting Dark Elves and Pirates, just play Eltharion instead of Alariel, Alethanar, or Tyrion. If you want to fight against Orcs and the Undead, play Imric. If you want to fight everyone ever all at once and love crushing your genitals with a rock, play Teclas. Speaking of the undead, you should join my Project Zomboid server, which I will put the details of in the pinned comment. Yeah, that's right, I'm plugging video game time right in the middle of the video. Half you click away by the time the video is over, I see those analytics, now it goes right in the middle. Anyways, back to elves. 
As a final bonus for most of their starting positions, Ulthuan doesn't have any of the crisis scenarios spawn on it, so you can just sit pretty while the world burns around you. Very elven. Once again, Teclis is absolutely screwed when it comes to this, since if you made it that far into the game, there's decent odds both the orcs and the Black Pyramid are your neighbors. But as has been discussed, if you're playing a Teclis campaign, you're probably there for the sheer thrill of getting the shit beat out of you. To get into mechanics, the Asur have all sorts of shenanigans you can pull to make their campaigns easier. Influence, for example, can be a major help so long as you remember that it actually exists. If you have enough stored away, just pump all of it into having friendly relations with whatever faction you want and they'll happily be your best friend. Want to confederate with neighboring elves but aren't on quite friendly enough terms? Influence makes them all too happy to change the colors on their flags to yours. Want to ally with the forces of chaos or the skaven? Not exactly very high elven of you, but enough influence can help you out with that. Alternatively, is there a strong enemy you aren't quite ready to face yet threatening to take you down? Spend influence to make his neighbors hate him, and swoop in to finish him off as he's distracted by two fronts. To help this out, whenever you form a trade agreement with someone, you can see inside their lands, which can help you be even sneakier with it. Maybe you want to be friends with someone for now, but either want to curb their growth or declare war on them later. Keep their relations with their neighbors in the red with influence, and you'll be sure to have an easier time going forward. Influence can also be used to recruit more powerful lords and heroes. The more influence you spend on the character, the better the trait they're going to have. Even the cheaper traits are usually pretty beneficial, and it plays into the whole courtly gossip vibe the Esser have going for them. Their buildings and economy are also solid. Now, I'm unsure if the old high elf economy cheese works any longer, so I can't comment on whether or not that's still viable. That being said, I really don't care for pointing out methods to break the game as a pro or a con, unless it's something that just naturally happens during gameplay, and recruiting 500 heroes with the same money-making trait isn't exactly an accident. What I do know is that their main money-making building is solid and produces tradable resources, their entertainment buildings also make money, and they have ways of boosting the income of both those and ports with other buildings. Pro tip, you live on an island, and the first few provinces you have outside of Ulthuan are probably going to be on the coast. You're not exactly short on ports. Once your economy gets rolling, it's probably not going to falter, short of either losing entire provinces at once or you having recruited entire armies of dragons. Speaking of their armies, you might wonder how they perform on the battlefield, and absurdly well is the answer. This is all in hard difficulty for campaign and battles, by the way, just as a reminder. I do not care for the hardest difficulty turning Skaven slaves into Chaos Warriors. Their basic units are some of the best in the game, relative to their cost and how soon you can unlock them. Forming a spear wall and then having arches behind them is a tactic that can carry you from turn 1 to turn 50. Once turn 51 rolls around, it's as simple as replacing the Spearmen with Silver and Guard, and Archers with Sisters of Avalorn, which are both the same thing, but better. Let me tell you about the Sisters of Avalorn. They're basically firing lightsaber bowcasters at the enemy. What you want to do is have at least four of them in your army, and have at least two firing on the same target. Watch as its health becomes a thing of the past, and bask in yet another resounding elven victory to add to the pile of them. That's not to say they're a one-trick pony by any means. Swordmasters of Hoeth are going to cut their way through most units in the game, assuming they're properly supported. Their cavalry is also solid, with Illyrian Reavers being some of the fastest light cavalry in the game. If you need some archers dealt with or want to harass the enemy from behind, you can do no better. Silver Helms, meanwhile, are the epitome of mainline cavalry, and in fact, they were the very inspiration for the Bretonians' obsession with horses. Why settle for cheap knockoffs when you can have the original? And of course, when all else fails, just throw a dragon at the enemy. You've got three different types of beings that canonically can reliably take on greater demons. Mechanically, I prefer to use them to take out blobs of infantry, but they're able to hold their own just fine against other monstrous units as well. Alariel has the added bonus of bringing the Wood Elves tree units to the fight as well, which is a wonderful addition to the already amazing roster. All of this is to say nothing of things like the Phoenix Guard, Phoenixes themselves, or Chariots. If you want to roll on the battlefield filled, you can find it among the High Elves. Don't think I'm neglecting their mages. These are elves, so naturally they have mages. One for every main lore of magic, as well as high magic. You can also recruit them as lords instead of just as heroes, so you can start spamming Lightning Storm at people right out of the gate if you really want to. You've not only got versatility, you've got the power, especially with the special traits the elves frequently come with thanks to influence. There's also the Lore Master of Hoeth Hero, who is a hybrid melee caster hero. He's got lots of targeted spells to help him snipe characters with, and once you give him some special items and level him up a bit, he can take on even some of the weaker legendary lords. And for the single, solitary thing Teclis has going for him, he's the best caster in the game. Once he's leveled up, he gets an arcane phoenix mount and can spam chain lightning and anything that pisses him off. He gets the passive skill from every single mainline lore of magic, spells from each, and in general, he's not going to be losing the magical game against any other army. Even Mazdamundi and Lord Croak don't offer the same level of magical BS that Teclis does. 
Ilariel also has a great magical game, but hers mostly revolves around the lore of life and being one of the best healers there is. Very useful, but not as fun to talk about as Teclis deciding the entire enemy front line needs to be on fire. And really, the best thing I can say about the Asur's military is that when everything is working in tandem, there's not a whole lot other armies can do to keep you down. When your melee troops keep the enemies occupied while your range units and mages tear into them from behind, while the cavalry and dragons keep the enemy range units in check, the high elves may as well be unbeatable. Their ancient war machine is unparalleled by anyone else once it's ready to go, so if you like playing the long game and armies where everything can nicely click together, these guys are definitely the choice for you. Of note is that their legendary lords are absolutely spectacular. Tyrion beats the shit out of anything that looks at him funny, and once he's on his mount, he goes from a melee beatstick to a heat-seeking missile. Teclas and Ilariel, as I've said, are mages extraordinaire, and while I rarely play Emmerich, he's got a dragon mount. That alone makes him stand out, so he's hardly a bad choice, even if the units he buffs are rather expensive. Alethanar and his Shadow Clones aren't my preferred lord, but if you pick him as your faction leader, he gets his unique units available to recruit, which are frankly disgusting to watch do their thing. And lastly, Eltharian the Grim. The smooth brain take on Eltharian is that since he's a melee caster hybrid, he's a shit mage and a shit melee fighter. The correct take on Eltharian is that he's going to beat any dedicated mage in a 1v1, and since he gets a griffin mount, you can just fly away from any melee lord too dangerous to take on and blast his army with spells. And oh hey, would you look at that, he has the spell Apotheosis, a healing spell. But surely there's no way he can be at least decent in melee, everything needs to be about min-maxing. If you can't solo an army with him, he's just a shit legendary lord. I say to hell with that, just go watch his trailer again and then get pumped to start another campaign. Tori of Rest will never fall because Batman is going to beat the shit out of any greenskin caught jaywalking within his borders. You call this resisting arrest? We call this a difficulty tweak. Lastly, the Sword of Cain. Any of the elf factions can draw it, be it the Wood Elves, Dark Elves, or indeed the High Elves. But unlike the other factions, you're the one whose homeland it's on, meaning that at any moment in time, you can decide that public order and diplomatic relations are for losers and pull that son of a bitch out of the stone. Have a wizard 1v1 Archaeon and win, that's just what the Sword of Cain lets you do. And if you give it to Tyrion, you don't need an army anymore. If anything, just recruit a bunch of missile units and bolt throwers. Tyrion will kill half the army, and the missile units get the other half. Though, do be careful, because while other elves are the only ones who can draw it initially, anyone who defeats the wielder can pick it up. You don't want Grimgor getting his hands on that thing. But though I love them so, I am not so blinded by my inclination towards elves that I cannot see they still have some flaws. Lore first, as we do. Yeah, I'm struggling here. I am struggling to find Lord Downsides right now. Maybe I am blinded. I guess that it's worth noting the elves are a dying race, as all elder races in fantasy settings are. So, you know, you've got that uphill battle to deal with. Well, that means a lot less in Total War compared to the tabletop. Their casualty replenishment isn't even that bad. Although, if you really want me to be as fair as possible, I suppose it can be a bit obnoxious how aloof they come across. Yeah, they are objectively better than everyone else in every way, but they could stand to be a bit more humble about it. The smithing building even has a funny line about it. They say elven smiths are unmatched. They, of course, being the high elves. Good stuff. And sure, I guess you could say that most of the elves are rather selfish and arrogant, looking down on how other races is beneath them. But look how tall they are. Everyone else is beneath them, it's just the facts. So what if dwarfs build better holds and have better beer and drink? So what if humans are the ones who usually decide the fate of the world? The dwarfs never come out of their damn holes, and it's mankind who usually puts the world into jeopardy in the first place. Just look at Nagash. He's all human. And before you say that it was elves who taught Nagash magic, consider that those were Dark Elves and the High Elves have done nothing wrong ever. Except for Kalidor II. He was, to put it gently, a colossal mistake of an elf. And yeah, I guess you can infer from the fact that the elves find temperate regions to be unpleasant climate, and you can technically say that they're a bunch of stuck-up whiners who can't handle anything short of the Garden of Eden to live on. But let me ask you something. If you lived in paradise for most of your life, then suddenly had to move to the middle of the Midwest, how well do you think you'd fare? I'm willing to bet you wouldn't like things much either. Checkmate, non-elf enjoyers. So now that we've determined the High Elves are completely perfect in all ways lore-wise, let's talk about their gameplay downsides where I actually can't just ignore the negatives. First off, Ulthuan itself. It is isolated on account of it being in the middle of the Atlantic Ocean, which means threats take a while to come to you and you'll see most of them coming at least a few turns in advance. The flip side of this is that it takes your army several turns to get anywhere once you've secured the homeland. This is something that'll haunt you well into the game, because even once you have a solid hold outside of Ulthuan, it'll take some time for those places to properly grow into their own major settlements. Even as you're expanding, this means that for some time, Ulthuan will still be where all your armies come from, and it'll take a while for reinforcements 
to properly make it to the front lines. And given that you're in the center of the world, it means that you'll have threats on all sides eventually. Now, in all fairness, a lot of the people surrounding you are, if not your best friends, then people you can at least form some non-aggression packs with. Mazda Mundi isn't the kind of neighbor I'd want to have, but he usually stays in Lustria for a while. But if you don't make sure to get the ball rolling reasonably quickly with expansion, Malekith and the forces of chaos are going to be beating down your door from multiple different angles. God help you if you don't have at least one province in Nagaroth by the mid-game, because otherwise it's going to be a game of constant defense against invaders. That is to say nothing of Imric, who gets to share his space with Grimgor, the Chaos Dwarfs, the Undead, and more. And Teclis, of course, but him being surrounded by people who hate him is just a given at this point. Also, you know how I said the High Elf economy is solid? I might have told a slight fib. Because while your economy is good in a vacuum, it's also feeding the hungriest military-industrial complex in the world. Your units are very expensive to maintain and recruit. Your standard spearmen might be able to outfight the empires every single time, but they're also several hundred more gold to purchase. To top it off, your buildings cost an ungodly amount, and unlocking new tiers of research takes a pretty penny as well. It doesn't get any better as you march up the unit tree, with new units naturally costing much more. Dragons aren't cheap, you know, but God only knows why from a lore perspective. My guess is that their upkeep is for the massive amount of food you need to keep them fed, but for all I know the dragons could just be demanding all that gold to pump it into shitcoins or something. Influence can also be a tricky thing to get. The most reliable way to get it is with the High Elf Noble Hero. His settlement action is gaining influence, rather than sabotaging walls or just butchering people. The issue is that you don't get a whole lot at once. If you aren't playing as a Lariel who reduces the cost of influence, it won't even be enough for a single relations action, especially since the more you use it to mess with people's opinions, the more it costs. Otherwise, it's up to one of two things to get influence. One is winning a battle and choosing the option to get influence and money, which fair is fair is usually the option I go with. I say this is less reliable than the hero because it's easy to say just win a battle until ten doomstacks show up outside your front door. Two was good old random events, and the options to gain influence result in a penalty, such as a public order reduction, trade income reduction, or just flat out costing you some cash. Though there are flip side events where you spend influence for a positive result. Now, I don't dislike this, but it's still a con to keep in mind, since if you don't have any influence, you can find yourself forced to take on penalties, since the beneficial options require a resource you don't have. Compounding on this is that while spending influence on lords and heroes gives you a good trait, spending no influence gives them a negative one. So if you want to expand your armies with lords who don't suck, sooner or later you're going to have to dip into the influence pool. If you're like me and don't spend influence too often, this isn't an issue, but if you frequently use it to muck about with the relations and buying powerful lords, you might find yourself disliking the system to some extent. It's not crippling by any means, but it's something to always keep in mind if you want to avoid drawbacks. Now onto their battlefield downsides. Let's start small. Martial Valor. It's an ability all the High Elves have, giving them some small buffs as long as their health is above a certain percentage. There is even a better version for more higher tier units. The issue here, as you can no doubt imagine, is that if you drop below that percentage of health, they lose the buff. So if you're losing badly enough to get to this point, odds are pretty good that not only are you going to keep losing, but it's going to be a pretty rapid downward spiral going forward. Second minor flaw, they're pretty lacking in the artillery department. It's just the bolt thrower. Now, it's not bad per se, but it's also not great. I like it because it's pretty damn good against light armored chaff, and if you point enough of them at a monster, it dies reasonably quickly, but it's not exactly a Hellstorm rocket battery or great cannon. Being charitable, it's a testament to elven skill and ingenuity that it still holds up at all on modern battlefields. Being less charitable, the elves are stuck about 2,000 years in the past, and this is the fantasy artillery equivalent of the Maginot Line. So out of all the things you can rely on for the high elves, your artillery shouldn't be one of them. I still personally like to keep a couple in each of my armies, but that's because I'm allergic to offensive gameplay in a strategy game. I should really get around to the dwarfs one of these days. Mushroom. Slightly more major flaw, the elves for the most part are not the healthiest of units. You aren't the Skaven by any means, and their bravery is good, so even as they get hurt, they're probably not just gonna leg it. But compared to, say, the Warriors of Chaos, Orcs, and Nurgle, you do not have a wealth of either hit points or armor. You gotta make sure to keep up with the damage output, otherwise you're gonna be in deep shit. Or just laser everyone with the Sisters of Avalorn before they can even come close to you. Don't need to worry about outlasting corpses. To get back to an earlier point, I said if you like the long game, you'll enjoy them. Well, the High Elves are certainly playing the long game. Between the isolation of Ulthuan and the cost of their buildings, you're going to be pretty deep into the game by the time your armies are at the full potential they can have. Early on, it's spearmen and archers as far as the eye can see. Hell, with a Lothar and Seaguard, you can make those two units one and the same. Aside from the obvious problem of if there's an enemy spearmen and archers can't handle, you're pretty fucked, it can also just get kind of boring waiting so long before you get actually interesting units. 
This isn't strictly speaking a problem completely unique to the High Elves. I mean, to go back to the Dwarves, half their roster is different flavors of dude in heavy armor who sits in front of a cannon. And sure, the basic High Elf military building also has upgraded spearmen and archers in it, but that's not exactly switching the battlefield roles of your army. It's just upgrading an already filled slot. Plus, it can be a bit monotonous pumping out the same units every time, whereas factions like the Empire can specialize in either infantry, cavalry, or range units by the time their settlements are at Tier 3. The fact that you can get to the late game with a beginning army is admittedly a pro all on its own, but variety is the spice of life and all that, you know? Compounding on this is that some units in the High Elf roster are a bit underwhelming. White Lions of Krace are like the Swordmasters of Hoath, but worse. The only time I ever use them is with an army led by Alistar or Korhil, Korhil of note only being in the game through mods. Dragon Princes are great cavalry, but also highly expensive, to the point that pound for pound you should probably just go with the Silver Helms instead. And my final complaint is that the Elves have a ton of unique units available to them in the most annoying way possible. Eltharion has his special arrest troops that are all the collective Robin to his Batman, Alariel has the Tree Folk, and the Sweet Life of Aletha Nar has his Elven Night Lords. Unfortunately, you only get any of those units if you're playing as their respective faction leaders. Which aside from meaning you can only ever reliably recruit one of them in a given playthrough, it also means that if you're playing Tyrion, Emric, or Teclis, you get to eat dick. No special units for you. And that really bothers me. I think I get what they're doing with it. It keeps the High Elven roster as a whole from becoming either too bloated or too overpowered. But it's annoying being told I have all these toys, but I can only play with one of them at a time, especially since Daniel over in the Chaos Waste has access to the entire Demons roster. But really, if those are the biggest criticisms I have of the High Elves, I think they're doing fine. And if it sounds like the con section was a lot less substantial than the pro section, that's because it is. I of course stand by what I said about them being entirely perfect from the point of view of lore, just please ignore all the vanity and the pleasure cults and the pulling of the Sword of Cain, just ignore that real big thing right there, please. But from a gameplay perspective, I have very little to truly complain about. They have a powerful military and their economy is easy to handle, even if both can be a bit hard to get rolling early on. Their homeland is perhaps the easiest one to secure in the game, even if every now and then you lose a city to some random horde who decided to pay you a visit. When I play High Elves, I rarely struggle much, to the point that depending on early game randomness and who attacks who, it's pretty much guaranteed I'm going to roll over the Dark Elves once I'm ready to leave Ultuan. And when the only way you're able to be stopped is if the AI decides to swarm you from turn 3 onwards, you're probably playing a fine faction. Genuinely, the biggest reason to avoid them is if you just don't like Elves. And if you don't like Elves, then I don't know why you clicked on a video about the High Elves. Am I biased in this matter? Oh, absolutely, 110%. But that's just how it is. The guy who likes Elves thinks Elves are incredibly strong and can't find much to criticize. So there's the Asur in Total Warhammer 2. Incredibly powerful and ancient, and even if they're destined to die out, they sure as hell aren't going gentle in that good night. Especially once Alariel becomes the murder bunny the AI just loves to turn her into. Seriously, are we sure she isn't the one who has the curse of Cain? Thank you to my wonderful channel members. You are the sword of Cain to my high elves, letting me beat back demon invaders. Look, it's been a rough couple of videos for the end video members joke. I'll have a better one for you later, I swear. As always, if you'd like to support the channel, feel free to subscribe or become a member. Either way, thank you for watching and take care out there. You know, sometimes when you click on a High Elf settlement, they shout out, Anarian's Will, and I gotta say, kinda disappointed there's no voice line for Kalidor. Anarian was a real badass, I'm not saying he wasn't. He soloed four greater demons of each god who were having power poured into them by their respective gods. But Kalidor is the reason for the Vortex. You know, that thing that lets the world continue to exist? He doesn't even get a shout out, and now that we're onto Warhammer 3, he's not even plot relevant anymore. My man was pretty much the entire reason Anarian eventually got his head out of his ass, and he had all the Asur ever yell on about is Anarian's will. Come on guys, you can do better. Do it for Kalidor, not for me.